Praise the Lord, everyone. My name is uh, Brother Glenn Dial. I'm from Fleming Island, Florida. And we're going to uh, do a little video a sermon this morning. And we wanted to talk about a subject that's been uh, been repeated a lot uh, of late. And I wanted to uh, just talk about the subject this morning of the coming of the Lord. And we're going to use some uh, scriptures. <clears throat> we're going to use uh, some quotes from the message of uh, Brother William Brown. And we're going to see if we can maybe come to some kind of a conclusion of actually what the coming of the Lord is. So uh, let's open, open with a word of prayer and invite him in, and then we'll go from there. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we have. Lord, we pray that you would be with us now. Help us to uh, take your word by the Spirit, Lord, that you've always revealed it by the Spirit. And the prophet told us there's nothing any greater than the revelation of Jesus Christ. Lord, so help us today as we look into these scriptures, look into these quotes, and may the people be helped, and may the Lord be glorified. And we, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now I want to read a scripture, and I want to start in Matthew uh, 24. And I want to read scriptures, Matthew 24 through 37, then I'm going to skip a little bit and read a couple of more. So Matthew 24, 34 through 37. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of, the, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. <clears throat> and I want to drop down now to verse 42 of Matthew 24 and read a couple more. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doeth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have his supper, his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. We have to pray the Lord will add his blessings to his word. And with that, I want to because <clears throat> as Brother Branham has told us that all the six seals were laid out in Matthew 24, but of course when he got to the seventh seal, he couldn't say anything about it. So from that time on, he goes to talking about the seventh seal. And in the church age book, Brother Branham makes this statement and let's read here. This is on page uh, 322. It said, Now, and the last and seventh vision was wherein I heard the most terrible explosion. As I turned to look, I saw nothing but debris, craters, and smoke all over the land of America. Based on these seven visions, along with the rapid changes which have swept the world in the last 50 years, I, pre I predict, I do not prophesy that these visions will have all come to pass by 1977. And though many may feel that this is an irresponsible statement in the view of the fact that Jesus said that no man knoweth the day nor the hour, I still maintain this prediction after 30 years because Jesus did not say no man can know the year, month, or a week in which his coming was to be completed. So I repeat, I sincerely believe and maintain as a private student 
of the word along with divine inspiration <clears throat> that 1977 ought to terminate the world systems and usher in the millennium. So he's saying that what Jesus said, but he said no man can know the day or the hour, but he didn't say the month, week, and the year in which his coming was to be completed. Now I want to <clears throat> look at a few of these things, and this is out of the, the souls that was in prison now there in 1963, and he said, and remember in that sixth seal where all the seven trumpets sound under that sixth seal, when we get to that, you'll see that every, the seven trumpet took place in that sixth seal. The seven is always the mystery. Watch that seven, that's the finish. That was the coming of the Lord. That was the coming of the Lord. And I want to stop right there. He said, that was the coming of the Lord, not it will be the coming of the Lord, but it was the coming of the Lord. I mean, now, we know that we know that he said the Lord comes three times. He comes one time to redeem her, he comes one time to get her, and he comes back with her. So, in the three, that finishes all up. So, he said, that was the coming of of the Lord, heaven was quiet, silent, nobody moved, because Jesus said himself, not even an angel of heaven knows when I will return. And we just read that in Matthew 24. I don't even know it myself what time. The Father has put it in his mind. God alone knows it, the Spirit said. I didn't know it then, it wasn't revealed when that seventh trumpet sounded or the seventh angel, a seal was open. There was silence in heaven, see? It wasn't give away what would take place. Now, people go back to this, not going on, and they said, then it was not revealed. Well, what's he talking about then when he preached the seven seals? Because when he come. He preached all the first uh, six seals, but when he got to the seventh, there wasn't a symbol or anything. All it was, there was just silence in heaven. And so when he opened the seventh seal, that's what there was. There was silence. He couldn't say anything about it because what? Nobody knew the day or the hour in which the Lord would come. And so now after from the March when he preached the seals, that we come down here, in November of 63, things have started to come to Brother Brown, and now he starts to reveal what has happened back there. Now, he said it was the coming of the Lord. It wasn't revealed when the seventh trumpet sounded or the seventh angel, a seal was open. There was silence in heaven. See, it wasn't give away what would take place. But now it's past that time, and now looking back towards the seventh seal, he brings out that that seventh is always a mystery. The seventh is the finish, and that seventh was the coming of the Lord because nobody would know what was going to happen Nobody was going to know what was going on. Jesus said that he, as a man, he didn't know himself. Only the Father, the Spirit, had it. <clears throat> and so this had been hid for 2,000 years, and it was going to be revealed because that was the job of the seventh angel was to reveal the mystery of God. And so he had to do this to fulfill his commission or he would have failed in his commission, but he said Revelations 10, 1 to 7 had been fulfilled. And the way God <clears throat> does his word, he, he makes a prophecy, and then he fulfills the prophecy, 
and then he lets you see what he has done. And that's exactly the way revelation happens. And now as we look back, so over 50 years of time, we can see all these things so plainly now. And the, some people look back and they don't see anything but this tradition and so on. And they keep looking to the future for these things to happen when they can't happen because they've already happened. But now he's telling us that was the coming of the Lord. <clears throat> and so we know that it was all quiet during that time, but from this time on, he starts to let it out, let it out, let it out what had taken place during that time. And still in souls in prison now, he said now, but remember all this time Noah was in the ark. Because we read there, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. The bride is sealed in with Christ. The last member has been redeemed. Has been, not going to be, has been. Well, how could you, how could you get that? Because he took the book of redemption and all that was in that book were the redeemed that he took. And now when their manifestation comes to be, that's up to God. But when he took the book, he had paid the price. He was the only one that could take it. He was the only one that could get it. And when he took it, he had everything that he had, had redeemed was in his hand in that book. So he said the last member had been redeemed. The sixth seal has produced itself. So the sixth seal was coming down through the ages, all the tribulation and so on that the people had gone through, especially the Jews had been scattered and being tortured and run out and everything else and then brought back together as a people, as a nation. The sixth seal has produced itself. The seventh seal brings him back to earth. Now, we know that when... If the six, the seventh seal brings him back to earth, he's got to come back to fulfill his word because that is just how he does the coming because the coming is written in the scripture and he has to come and fulfill that word. And of course, he said, the lamb came and took the book out of the right hand of him and set down what he claimed, what he had redeemed. That's right, it's always been that third pool. So the Lamb, which is a symbol of Christ, come back and took the book out of the right hand of him and claimed what he had owned, what he had redeemed. It's always that third pool. Well, what did he say the third pool? The third pool was the opening of the word, the mysteries revealed. Now, it says, I want to go just a little bit further here. And what shall I do with Jesus called Christ there in Jeffersonville, 1963? And he said, who would dare to say that wasn't the inspired word of God when he foretold it here and sent out yonder to Arizona to bring it right, right back? Even with science and everything else and proved it so. This book is already open, that's right, just waiting for the seventh seal to be identified with the coming of Christ. Waiting, and so if it's waiting, that means it's already happened and the people have to identify that, what happened, and I'm talking about what happened, duh, what already happened, there in 1963, they have to identify that with the coming of Christ. So all of these things he's pointing back, not pointing to a future time, he's pointing back. And so the people, they look to the future. Well, why, why would they look to the future when it's so plain what he's talking about here? Because 
They have got the coming. They've got it broke up. Well, he come, but he's coming. Well, he come, he come spiritual, but he's coming natural. Well, I, I just read the other day where he said there, there wasn't two comings of the Spirit. There was only one. He comes spiritual on the day of Pentecost. Jesus Christ come in the form of the Holy Ghost. But when he come this time, he was supposed to come as son of man, a prophet on the earth to fulfill the ministry that he had 2,000 years ago would be back on the earth again this day, and it was. It was fulfilled. But it's hard for people to get away from tradition. Look here, we've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of traditional church teaching. We had it when the Catholics took over and Luther come out with that little re reformation, the just shall live by faith, and he got a little peace, but he carried on with all the traditions. The Methodists come out with their little sanctification, going back another step, but they carried right on with the tradition. Pentecost come out with the, the return of the gifts and so on, but they carried right on with the church tradition, and people are still carrying on with the church tradition. No matter what God would do, they carry right on with their church traditions, almost negating what God has done. And you know, he done these things for a purpose. And I was talking to somebody the other day, and they they say, well, if he come in 1963, I wasn't even born until, uh, we'll say, 1983. You mean he come and I totally missed it? No. If your name was in that book when he took it, you're already in. You just don't know it yet. But you, if your name is in that book, you will recognize your day, its message, and you will say, I do, and you will be part of it. That's what makes you part of it when you get a clear understanding of what has happened. But most people, they never go that far because they're looking at everything through a traditional eye. But we was talking about, now, if, if I was a... a a missionary to America because it really needs one. And you say, well, everybody knows about Jesus Christ. Well, they might know the name, but most of this generation nowadays, they don't even know what he done hardly. All they know is the Easter time, they put up a cross and it, <clears throat> at uh, Christmas time, they put him back in a, a manger, a little baby. Other than that, they don't know much about him. But if we found somebody that was truly interested and we could give them the story of Jesus Christ, how he was born of a virgin, how he lived his life, how that God met him and filled him and used him for a ministry to be God manifest in the flesh on this earth. And they could see that and believe that it would be just as real to them 2000 years later as it was happened 2000 years ago. Because the missionaries do that all the time. They go all over the world telling the story about Jesus Christ. And some of the people, they believe that, and some of them don't believe it. But when they tell that story and they believe it, it's just as real to them like it happened for them, even though it happened 2,000 years ago. And it is just as real because God accepts their faith in what he has done and he gives them the, the, the prize. Now, here we are, 50-something years later, after the coming of the Lord. Well, now, when you meet somebody, a real, true believer, and you tell them what God has done in our day, <clears throat> some 50 years ago, and you tell them how that God raised up a prophet from birth, how he identified him at his birth, how he kept his hand on his life and sent him out with a message that would turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children, the Pentecostal children, and talk about his life and what God done through him and what he was supposed to do and what his mission was on this earth was to introduce Jesus Christ to the world 
and you tell them that and they see that, that is just as real to them right now as it was 50 years ago. The same thing. But most people never can get past all the tradition and so on to actually see what God has done in this day and who covers it over. Who covers over the truth? It is the ministry. Rather than just tell the people, look here, I don't understand it, but that was the coming of the Lord. The Lord has descended and he had come on the scene and look here, I'm not gonna to try to figure it out and so on. I'm just gonna accept what he said and then run off somewhere and get a quote over here, bring a quote back over here and just make the whole thing into a mix up. When he plainly said, that was the coming of the Lord. But no, as long as they can cover it over and <clears throat> pretend like, well, and look here, I've been hearing that about he's come and he's coming since the middle 80s. God finally gives somebody the revelation of the Son of Man. And I was in a church, and one day my pastor come by where I worked, and he said, Brother Glenn, guess what? I said, what? He said, the Lord has come. I said, I said, he, he has? He said, yeah. I said, how? He said, well, he come back to Son of Man. And I said, well, what, what are we going to do? He said, I don't know. And so we started from there. And it was about 1987 that the Lord called me to start a work in another town. And from that time, I was no longer under a pastor. I couldn't call him up every Saturday night and say, hey, what, can, what do I need to preach this Sunday? No, I had, to, I had to get into the Word. I had to study. I had to get into the Bible, and I had to, to get it for myself because what I was, was saying, I was going to be responsible for. And I did that. And God started to show me through the, the Scriptures and through the message that He had returned according to the Word and what the prophet had said. And from that time, I started to preach that the Lord had come. Only had just a little sliver of it, but I believed that he had come. And I told some of the brothers and so on, they said, oh, no, no, that, that's not the way. I said, well, to me it is. And I said, all these things have, are, have happened, and we're just looking back at what has happened. And one a, a brother that... Me and him was pretty close. He said, now, he said, now, Brother Dahl, he said, I, I, I just don't see that. He said, you know, but if you do, that's okay. He said, but I just don't see that. And so we continued to be friends and so on. But a lot of people, they said, well, that's just heresy. And they just shut it away, just pushed it totally away from them. But no matter what, it's still the truth. And it is the truth today that the Lord has come. He has fulfilled his word. And just as we read in the scripture, he said, if the thief would have known, if they would have known what watch the thief would have come in, they would have watched. Well, he said he comes in the seventh watch, which is the seventh church age. And it says, therefore know that, that you know not the hour that he comes, but he's talking about when that he's coming in a time when nobody don't know anything about it. Matthew 24, 44. In such an hour as you think not the Son of Man coming. Well, 50 years ago, the people wasn't even thinking about it. They hardly knew what a Son of Man was. Brother Bell had to come on the scene and explain what a Son of Man was. He said, Son of Man is a prophet. And he went back to the scriptures and proved it and told us exactly what it was. So they wasn't even thinking about the Son of Man coming. Okay, now today everybody's got their binoculars on the sky and they're looking, they're searching the skies. Oh, I, I know he's coming. I know he's coming. I know he's coming. Well, that too. But he's already come. And he proved that he's come. 
He has fulfilled his word. He has fulfilled it because he said that seven is <clears throat> the finish. And if there was any word to be uh, unfolded, the prophet would have done it while he was here, which he did do it. He said, this is the complete revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, if, if God was going to do something, he had to do it while the prophet was here because the word of the Lord comes to the prophet. Now, we have the word of the Lord in the form of the message of Brother William Branham. And now, if we want to know what God has done and what he is doing, we look back to the message. And it plainly says that these things have been fulfilled. God fulfills his word, and then he lets you see what he has done. But of course, not everybody is going to believe that. When Jesus come the first time, he come exactly with the scriptures, to the T with the scriptures, born the right place, born of a virgin. All these things grew up in Nazareth, fulfilled all the scriptures, turned water into wine, multiplied fish and loaves, raised the dead, healed the sick, opened blind eyes. Well, you think, well, anybody would believe him if he'd done all those things. Well, some of the common people heard him, but the clergy, what did they say? The priest, the clergy of that day, what did they say? Oh, well, they had to give the people some reason that he was doing all these things. So, oh, they said, oh, he's doing it by the power of the devil. He's Beelzebub, one of his chief princes down here. And Jesus said, look here, I'll forgive you. But when the Holy Ghost comes and does the same thing, it will not be forgiven in this world or the world to come. And the Holy Ghost came in the body of William Branham and done the same thing. And what did the world do? They laughed at it. They said, oh, it's, it's some kind of spiritualist thing. It's telepathy. It's this, that, or the other. Oh, yes, they wanted their, their sick to be healed. They wanted to, to see the gift of God work, but they didn't want to believe it. So where does that put all these people? It puts them in trouble. Because what proof that Jesus Christ had in his ministry and the, the ministry of that day totally rejected him? Could you imagine Something that had never been done on this earth, that one man would take a blind man from birth and open his eyes, and the people would question that? What proof? What truth? But the clergy completely rejected it. Well, you know, history repeats itself. And who has rejected this coming this day? The clergy has rejected it. Oh, they say, well, you know, he come this way and he come this way and this happened and that happened and oh, so and so and so. But they failed to see that that was the exact ministry of Jesus Christ back on the earth again, just like he said it would be. And Brother Branham makes it pretty simple. He said, I am a son of God. I am a, excuse me, I am a son of man revealing the son of man. Oh, they say, well, the son of man is the word. Yeah, but the word was made flesh, and it was made flesh again in our day. So simple. And Brother Ram said, Jesus, when he was here, he said, it's not me that does these works. It's my father that dwells within me. He does the work. When Brother Brown was here, he said, you know a man can't do these things. Yeah, a man don't know your name. A man can't heal you. A man can open your eyes. He said, it is the Holy Spirit that's among us now. He is the one that's doing the work. And you would think with such a ministry, ministry as this, that it went around the world, round and round and around, to proclaim to the world that the Son of Man was back on earth again, 
and then for the whole world to miss it just as they did back 2,000 years ago. But so <clears throat> history repeats itself. Well, as it was in that day, 2,000 years ago, the ministry is the one that kept the people away from the truth. And as it is in this day, the ministry has kept the people away from the truth. Oh, they say, well, you know, this part's right, but I don't really know about that part over there. Because, you know, I mean, we, we're probably waiting on that. Because, you know, he's, he's come, but surely he's coming. No, that was the coming of the Lord. And Jackie, give me a sip of water. So that was the coming of the Lord. And so they try to, they try to hide it. They try to cover it over with all their, we'll, we'll say this, their smooth words and their, their sermons and everything else. And they'll bring out this quote and that quote and everything else. And when they get through, it's not even close to the real truth of what God is trying to bring out. So, <clears throat> we have to stay with the word. Now, you figure, in Jesus' day, he was able to pull out uh, just uh, a few disciples. And when it really come down to him, they didn't, they didn't really, really believe who he was because when, when times got tough, what happened? They all left. Well, why did they all leave? Because he told Peter, he says, Peter, after you are converted, strengthen the brethren. So they went to the upper room and had the experience on the day of Pentecost. And once they had Jesus not walking with them, but Jesus on the inside, they were different men and women, women, and it's the same thing today. It's it's not just to have him walking alongside, but it's to have him taking up residence on the inside by way of the new birth. And let's just <clears throat> maybe look at the new birth just for a, a few minutes. Uh, here. And I had <clears throat> put this uh, on uh, Facebook here a while back. And uh, I made the statement that the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ is the same self spirit. To meet the Lord in the air, wind is air. Not the man, but the spirit. Did not Paul meet him, spirit, on the road, on the road to Damascus? And the voice said, I'm Jesus. Now, reading from uh, the Paradox, 1965, he said, Now, how do you do, sir? Another man, that's a person who is a stranger to me. I don't know. I don't know the man. Now, as far as I know, I've never seen him in my life. But now the spirit... The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ is the same self spirit. So the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ is the same self spirit. So when you receive Christ, when you receive the Holy Spirit, when you receive the Father, you have received the totality of God because these three are one. Now, if he's here, how can he be coming? If that was the coming of the Lord, that means he fully come. He didn't leave another part somewhere else. That means he fully come on the scene and Brother Brown identifies him as being here and so 
the, the, there's not two. And if I ever tried to get anything across to anybody, it's that God is one God. I don't care what form he's in. I don't care if he's in the pillar of fire, or the pillar of cloud. I don't care if he's in the man Jesus Christ or the, the, the wind and, and the fire that come on the day of Pentecost. That is God. And so, so many people, when he comes with a different manifestation, they say, well, that's him. But what about this one over here? Brother Brown said he just changes his form. And so, so when he does that, of course, the people with their traditional outlook and so on, they get all confused and say, well, you know, uh, there, there's two, there's three. And I guess nowadays, if we count them up, how many would they be? But there's, there's only one, one God. He said, now, the anointed one, Jesus, the man, was the Son of God, but the Holy Spirit was on him. My Father dwells in me. See, it's the Holy Spirit, so it's still God. And then to just make another statement to kind of back this up in the harvest time <clears throat> there in 1964, I said, yeah, that's him that come on the day of Pentecost. Yes, sir, he came and lived in them. Notice in the form of the person of the Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ in the person of the Holy Ghost as we understand the Godhead, as we understand the God, not as they understand the Godhead because they got two, they got three, they got how many, but we've got one in the Godhead. <coughs> now, this is talking about the new birth, John 3 and 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? So Jesus is trying to, to tell him, about this new birth because he said you must be born again and he's typing the spirit with the wind he's trying to to show Nicodemus something that that he as a natural man can understand that he says the wind the wind blows and he says you can't see the wind but maybe you see the the, the trees sway back into maybe you see the leaves move. And that's the only way you know that the wind is blowing, but you don't see the wind. But you can see the effects it's having on the natural part. And you hear us the sound thereof, but you cannot tell from whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. And of course, <clears throat> Nicodemus being a man, he said, well, you know, if, if you can't understand natural things, how would you ever understand spiritual things? Well, we could say the same thing to, to the people today. Look here, if you can't understand the natural things that you can actually see with your eyes, how would you ever understand the spiritual things that God is doing this day and has done? So now, he said, Verse 5, except a man be born of water and spirit. That pattern on the day of Pentecost was to be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The new birth was water and spirit 
The pattern don't change, Acts 2, 38. The pattern don't change. God don't take his word back. So, of course, there are some people that says uh, that he does, but he does not. Now, we're talking about this spirit because Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost is the same self spirit. Acts 2 and 1. And when the day of, day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there come a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Okay, the day of Pentecost. They were all in one place with one accord and they were waiting for the promise that Jesus told them to go there and wait until... And so all of a sudden, there come a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they were... All this wind and fire, what was it representing? It was representing the Holy Ghost that had come and filled each one of them, which was the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God come into them and made them new creatures in Christ Jesus, and they proved that they were by the lives they lived from thereafter. So, it, just, it happens that way, but it seems like people, they, they forget these things, or they read over them, or something's been covered up to them. And it says that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. So the Spirit came into them, and the Spirit began to give them utterance in another language, that they did not know. But it proved that it was another language because when they went out into the, to the city, the people from all over the country that had come to Jerusalem for the Passover heard them speak in their own language. So God is able to do that. Now, this is the promise that Jesus said, I am with you, and now, now be within you. Now, Jesus has gone back to the spirit form to come in the people. He could not do that as a man. Because Jesus, when he was walking, he said, now, I'm walking with you now. But he said, I'm going to come back and I'm going to be in you. And of course, they didn't understand that. And a lot of people don't understand that today. They think Jesus is something external. They think Jesus is just a man that walked the shores of Galilee and so on 2,000 years ago. But Jesus said, I come from God and I'm going back to God. I come from the Spirit. I'm going back to the Spirit. And when I come on the day of Pentecost, that Spirit is going to be in you, which he proved that it was. And in John 3, 8, Jesus tells Nicodemus to compare the spirit to the wind so that he might understand about what he was talking about. And in Acts 2.2, 2, the coming of the spirit was represented by wind and fire. It was Jesus coming as the Holy Spirit. And then we want to look, talking about the spirit now, we want to look in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say un unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now, it says that, that we which are alive and remain. Now, the only way 
that you could be alive <clears throat> unto this coming, you had to be born again. Because this happened, and the world knows nothing about it. Because, why? Because he, Paul told him, he said, ye were dead in sin and trespasses. But he said, you have been quickened. You have been made alive. So this is only for the people that are the born again people upon this earth that will know anything about this. The world won't know anything about it. They'll go right on just like they always have, just like they did in the days of Jesus and every other day. No matter what God was doing, they didn't care anything about it. So he says, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, there's just a few highlights out of this First Thessalonians. Now, it says verse 415, unto the coming of the Lord, not unto the comings of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. Verse 16, a shout, a voice of an archangel and a trump of God. And verse 17, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And I had a note here, see the cloud picture in Life Magazine, May 17th, 1963. Look here, Jesus, in Acts 1, he went away with clouds. And he said, this same Jesus will return, in like, will return again in like manner with clouds. So was it just a coincidence that when Brother Branham pointed, said, there's Jesus in the sky? There's a, that's our Lord up there. Was it just a coincidence that it happened to come out like a, a picture of a cloud? And they had, a, they had upon the top of it a mystery. Well, look here. That's not a mystery to us. That not, that's not a mystery to the to believers. We know what it was because he told us what it was. And they said, well, why don't you go tell them people in that, this, this trying to find? He said, he said, the Lord told me not to tell them. So they just go right on like they always have. And they have, not knowing a thing about what God has done. Now, Brother Ram said that the cloud was Jesus. Not Jesus the man, but Jesus the Spirit. The same one that came on the day of Pentecost. Revelations 10 was the seventh seal, and the seventh seal was the coming of the Lord. The rapture message. Now, the rapture message was preached in December 4th, 1965. It was one of the last messages that he was going to preach. And don't you think that if that was going to be his last message and he entitled it to rapture, he was going to tell us what the rapture really was. Not flying off like a bunch of birds somewhere because he said, you don't fly off. He said, all you do is just step over there. Heaven's around us all the time. It's just another dimension faster than this. But Brother Brown stepped over there when he went beyond the curtain of time. But no, they got this traditional idea about a flying Jesus coming down and flying people going up. You see the pictures? You see it all over Facebook? You see it in Christian literature and everywhere else? And that's all it is, is a traditional teaching that has no basis, no foundation in the scripture. Because... We seen what the rapture was, and we was there. So that's pretty clear. But now talking about this rapture, he said, now, the first thing comes when he starts descending from heaven. There's a shout. 
He says, what, what is it? What is what? What is this shout? It's a message to get the people together. It sounds like to me that holy convocation that he was talking about. Because the holy convocation is a gathering of the people. He said, to, it's a message to get the people together. A message comes forth first. Now the sixth, the seventh, behold the bridegroom cometh. Now he jumps over to Matthew 25, talking about the, the five wise and the five foolish virgins, about behold the bridegroom cometh. Rise and trim your lamps. And they did. And some found out they didn't have any oil. They did not have the Holy Spirit. So how are you going to go in without the Holy Spirit? He said, and they, some of them found out they didn't have any oil in their lamp, see, but it's lamp trimming time. It's Malachi 4 time. What he promised is Luke 17. And it's, uh, and all those prophecies that can perfectly set in order for this day, all those prophecies that can perfectly be set in order for this day, not some, for some future day, but for this day in the scripture, and we see it living right here. My goodness, the scriptures he's talking about, he said, we see it living here. The, the word has been made flesh because those scriptures are no longer just on the printed page. They're up moving around being fulfilled by people on the earth in that day. So, but of course, you know, I was thinking about this message almost parallels with Noah's message. Noah preached 120 years. And no doubt, he preached hard, and he preached regular, and he preached with conviction and passion and everything else, trying, trying to warn the people what was, what was going to take place. And you know what? He got himself and his family. The, the scripture says, eight souls were saved as by water. But you know, the, the message that he was preaching saved him and condemned the whole world. One man's message saved him and his family and condemned the whole world. Now you would think somebody to preach that passionately and so on for 120 years that, that he could get somebody to believe him. But no. Nobody. They just thought he was some kind of a, a crackpot. They thought, well, the, the old man, he's been out in the sun and, and there's something wrong with him. Don't pay no attention to him. Just ignore him. He comes around all the time with that, that same old message that it's going to rain, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, and God's going to flood this place. And they say, it never rained around here. There ain't no flood. What's he talking about? So, and here we've been going with this message for years and years and years, that the coming, that was the coming of the Lord, that he has come, fulfilled his word, and we are now telling what he has done. And if, if I tell it to you, and you accept it, and you believe it, you get the same thing that I got. It proves that you were in that book that he took. The Lamb's book of life, before the foundation of the world. And then, if you reject it, well, it puts you in the same place that the people that rejected Noah's message in his day, didn't the Bible say that they all perished? Yes. Now, so, he said, now, still in the rapture, he said, now, the first thing is the sounding. The first thing is a trumpet or a voice, a shout, and then a voice, and then a trumpet. Shout, a messenger getting the people ready. The second is the voice of the resurrection. The same voice, a loud voice in St. John 11, 38 through 44, that called Lazarus from the grave. 
getting the people together and then the resurrection of the dead, see, to be caught up with it. Now watch these three things take place. Next is what? Was a trumpet, a voice, a shout, a voice, a trumpet. And this is the note that I give. A shout. It's the message. The voice of the resurrection for the ones that died through the church ages and to be caught up with us in the air, the spirit. Now the third thing, back in the rapture, now the third thing is a trumpet, which always is at the feast of the trumpets, calling the people to the feast. And that'll be the bride's supper. Oh my, 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 my. Oh, they told me that the bride's supper is way, that's way on off somewhere. That uh, I don't know exactly what they have in mind for the, the bride's supper, but uh, I've heard some people say they might have fried chicken, they might have chicken and rice or something like that, but I don't believe that's what that we're going to be eating over there. So he said, <clears throat> The feast of the trumpets is calling the people to a feast, and that'll be the bride's supper, the lamb's supper with the bride in the sky. Now, this is all happening in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Not do this and then come over here another 50 or 75 years or whatever they want it to be, and then it all to happen over here. No, it's all happening at one time. But no, the we're not going to have that. That don't fit with tradition. That's not the people wouldn't have that. Well, who is leading this thing? The people? Uh, you know, that's what happened to David that time. He listened to everybody. He went to the captains and the big shots and everybody else and said, you know, we want to do this. And they said, yeah, David, go ahead. But, you know, he forgot one thing. There was a prophet in the land and he never consulted him. And so has it today. So it'll be the bride supper, the lamb supper in the sky. The first thing comes forth is his message, calling the bride together. The next thing is the resurrection of the sleeping bride, the ones that died back in other ages. They're caught together, and the trumpet, the feast in the heavens and the sky, why, the thing that takes place in why? That's the thing that takes place, friends. And this is a note. The trumpet equals the bride's supper. The supper is not natural food. It's spiritual food. We are feeding on the unfailing body word. Jesus, Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. The words I speak are spirit and life. That is what we're feeding on, the Word and the Spirit. We are the ones that are alive and remain. Our commission is to prophesy again, Revelations 10, 8 through 11, to tell the people that Jesus Christ has fulfilled His Word and that they can be caught up with him by believing his word for this day. It has to be in the word in season. This is spiritual food in our season. So that was the coming of the Lord. Now, this, this subject covers many, many areas. But this is, just, this is just one of the areas that it covers because when this thing happened, the, the word was fulfilled. And God, by his spirit, has allowed us, by the spirit, to look back and see what actually has taken place. So I thank the Lord. If I have to bear a persecution or whatever for this message, so be it. If, if I have to preach and nobody accepts it, so be it. But I'm not the first one to do that. So I'm glad that God has allowed me to see the revelation for this day and for this hour 
And I am glad that I'm able to proclaim it. And maybe somebody will hear this, listen to this, and say, you know, that ain't nothing but the truth. I believe that. And go back and read the scripture and read the quotes and read the message and see if it all comes together. And you can say yourself, that was the coming of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your spirit that's brought it all to pass. And for the spirit of Christ, Lord, that's revealed it to us. And Lord, we're glad and we're so happy that we're able to proclaim it, that you've chosen us before the foundation of the world. And you've chosen us to be a voice in this last day, Lord. As everything is winding up and people are getting ready, Lord. They're getting ready for all kinds of things. But Lord, we're getting ready to step out of here one day. And when our mission is complete, we will do that. And Lord, we give you the all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus Christ's name because you have included us in this great thing and you are our great king and Lord you've chosen us to be your queen this day and you said come stand by my side and Lord the king's sword is ready this morning and it's going to and fro and it's cutting as it comes and goes Lord and it will accomplish that which you have desired for it to do so we give you praise and we thank you for it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Praise the Lord.